This is a pair of Super Team S All Carbon Ultra H2 road wheels in 50 millimeter depth and an inner width of 23 millimeters. It has 21 bladed carbon spokes per wheel, which are designed to be light, strong, and aerodynamic. This, on the other hand, is a pair of Goosen TIEFI R50 wheels, also in 50 millimeter depth and an internal width of 25 millimeters. It has 20 titanium fiber stringy spokes per wheel, which are designed to be even lighter, even stronger, and importantly, more compliant than any steel or carbon spoke on the market. Now, both of these wheels are tubeless ready and they feature hooked rims, with the biggest difference, of course, being the titanium fiber polymer spokes on the Goosen wheels. Now, there are some pretty bold marketing claims that suggest that the polymer spokes yield both a faster and more comfortable wheel set due to the vibration damping properties of the spokes. In this video, a pseudoscientific evaluation of the specific claim that there's significant vibration damping and consequently a more comfortable ride experience with the Goosen wheels. So for starters, the Super Team Ultra H2 wheels are a dedicated road wheel set. Carbon rims and carbon spokes. The spokes are very much bladed, measuring 3.2 millimeters wide. The hubs are a straight pull design and they use a ratchet style free hub with 54 tooth ratchets installed from the factory. The claimed weight is 1290 grams. Now through my testing with the wheels so far, They've been pretty pleasant with honestly not much to report. These wheels will set you back $1,100 in mid-2025, and I think they represent a pretty mid-level carbon road wheel set. Certainly nicer and lighter than most stock wheel sets, and the average cyclist would definitely notice a difference upgrading from the wheels that came on the bike. If I have any gripes with these wheels, it would probably just be the straight pull hub design with no safety measure for spoke retention. Now, it was Peak Torque who did a video on this, and I have to agree, if one or two spokes fail, then the other spokes can easily lose tension, and without spoke tension, there's nothing preventing the remaining spokes from falling out of the hub, which could be disastrous, and importantly, it could be totally avoidable with like a little threaded plastic disc serving as a retention plate. Nonetheless, lots of wheels feature this simple straight pull design, but it does sometimes make me a little bit uncomfortable. Also, there are some claims on the website about the shark fin pattern on the rim itself, that I find just a little bit tiresome. The Super Team wheels have this wavy design along with some dimples molded into the rim, supposedly improving aerodynamics. Now the verbiage on the website claims that it uses quote, bionic technology, and that quote, rugged surfaces have better aerodynamics than smooth ones. Okay, so first the term bionic was popularized in the 1960s as a combination of bio, relating to humans, and electronic. So basically what I'm saying is that there's nothing bionic about these rims. Also, blanket statements like rugged surfaces have better aerodynamics than smooth flat ones, well, that's just not true. This is a case of it depends on the design, and I'm just not convinced that the designers of this rim did any legitimate CFD on various shark fin dimple designs, otherwise we'd have heard more about the quantitative benefits. So anyways, if it feels like I'm picking apart the marketing claims of the Super Team wheels, well, it's because I kind of am. The point of this video, broadly speaking, is to try and help the consumer, you and me, make more informed decisions and to be critical of what the marketing materials claim for various products. Which leads me to this wheel set, the Goosen TIEFI R50 wheels. Now these are also 50 millimeters deep. They have hooked rims with an internal width that's two millimeters wider than the Super Teams at uh, 25 millimeters. Now again, I've had these set up with the same GP5000 32 millimeter tires with TPU tubes during the testing period. And I have to say, I couldn't feel a big difference. Now, perhaps I was just expecting a more significant amount of compliance built into these wheels. After all, Goosen's website claims, quote, vibration absorbing comfort, and the Panapodium website claims, quote, 15% more comfortable than steel spokes which actually I wasn't even aware that Comfort had an SI unit. Anyways, again, what we're doing is trying to address some of the marketing claims that honestly can be a bit irksome at times. But fortunately, I've done a little bit of science and gathered some data on both of these wheel sets so that we can see what the actual differences are in terms of vibration absorption and consequently comfort. So the test I ran was pretty straightforward. Honestly, it's very similar to the other vibration damping videos I've done on the steel hardtail frames and the carbon handlebars. So I fixed an accelerometer data logger at the top of the seat tube because that's where you'd feel a lot of the road vibrations. And then I ran four separate tests. Now first was a half mile road section, slightly downhill on the Super Team Ultra H2s. 
Again, Conti GP5000 tires in 32 millimeter width, set up with a TPU inner tube at 60 PSI. Then with the same setup, I did a half mile fire road descent to represent like a really rough road, being careful to stay seated and not to get too rowdy. Then I swapped the wheels for the Goosen TIEFI R50 wheels right there in the parking lot using the same bike, same tires, same inner tubes, again inflated to 60 PSI. Now with this setup, I rode the same road section and then again the same fire road section and measured accelerometer data for all four tests. Now every time I put out a vibration study like this one, I have to do a quick explainer on the frequency domain because typically people are used to visualizing the data in the time domain, but for vibration analysis, turns out there's really not much you can get from looking at the data in this domain. So here's just a really quick snippet from a previous video that does a decent job explaining the frequency domain. I do need to explain the concept of something called the frequency domain because it's kind of what makes this experiment work. So if you look at a single sine wave, it looks like what you remember from high school math class. And this is what the signal looks like in the time domain. Notice the x-axis is time. However, in what's called the frequency domain, a single sine wave looks a little bit different. Now this is called a power spectral density plot or PSD. And it's a plot not in the time domain, but rather in the frequency domain. Note the x-axis is frequency of oscillation and not time. Now in this plot, the same sine wave that we just saw is a single spike at the frequency of oscillation. The plot is really just an indication of the amount of power in a given signal as a function of frequency. So for instance, let's go back to the time domain and now look at a signal that contains two pure sine waves at different frequency. It looks a little bit weirder, but this is what it looks like in the time domain. In the frequency domain, however, as you might have guessed, the same signal is represented as two distinct spikes at their respective frequencies. Now this type of plot, the PSD, is much more useful when you're analyzing vibrational data because a typical vibration signal like the ones collected on the trail are not one or two perfect sine waves but rather they look more like a crazy cluster of seemingly random vibrations. Now it was Fourier who came along in the early 1800s and showed us that any stationary periodic signal can be broken down into some linear combination of many perfect sine waves through something called the Fourier transform. And that's really the key here. Crazy looking vibrational signal that looks like this in the time domain might actually look like this in the frequency domain. Now in this hypothetical example here, we have two vibrational signals that look virtually the same in the time domain, but once you look at them in the frequency domain, we can reveal that one signal has a lot of power in the lower frequency range, and the other has more power in the higher frequency bandwidth. And so with that extremely brief introduction into the frequency domain, we can now look at some of the data from our experiment. Before we just jump right into the frequency domain plots, there is one thing that you can take away from the time domain data, which is the root mean squared or RMS value of the signal. The RMS value of a time domain signal gives us a normalized value that corresponds to the amount of energy in the signal. In our case here, we can correlate the RMS value to the overall vibrational energy in these data sets. So looking at the time domain plots, on the left we have the road data, with the blue data representing carbon spoke wheels, and the red data representing the polymer spoke wheels. Now you can see mostly steady rumbling with a couple of big spikes that probably represent rolling over a bump in the road or like a manhole cover. These spikes don't affect the RMS in any significant way because again the RMS value represents a sort of normalized average over the entire data set, which for this 85 second set represents about 30,000 data points. Anyways, the RMS values between the two wheel sets for the road data, it's practically identical. In fact, doing the math, they're actually only off by 0.0004 Gs or 0.04% difference, which is definitely within the sensor noise and not significant at all. Now I can't say that this surprises me as it was a relatively smooth road while pedaling at a constant cadence. Now if we shift over to this plot, which represents the fire road data, which on the plot here, I'm actually calling the gravel data, Again, upon inspection, the data for both wheel sets is certainly of larger amplitude. After all, this was a dirt trail that's meant to be representative of a very rough road. For this experiment, the RMS for the Goosen polymer spoke wheels was actually lower than the carbon spoke wheels, but not by much, about 5.5% lower than the carbon spoke wheels. 
Now, jumping into the frequency domain plots, this is where we can really start to analyze the vibrations within the frequency spectrum. Broadly speaking, both the road and gravel data show a primary bandwidth of vibrational activity in the 10 to 50 hertz range. Now, this is very consistent with other vibrational analysis videos that I've put out. Now, for the road data, it's pretty convincing that for all intents and purposes, they're the same. Although focusing on the 10 to 80 hertz bandwidth, there are a couple of spots right around say the 25 to 40 hertz range where we do see some small increases in the blue plot over the red, indicating that the carbon spoked rims may feel a little bit harsher. But it seems to be counterbalanced by the 45 to 85 hertz range where there are a couple of places where the red plots are slightly higher than the blue. So in total, they yield the same RMS value, but the frequency content within the signal is distributed slightly different for these wheels. Now for the gravel data, looking at the primary 10 to 50 hertz bandwidth, it's pretty clear that in the 35 to 55 hertz range, there are a few spots where there's more power in the carbon spoke wheels than the goosen. Again, suggesting that the polymer spoke wheels are absorbing more vibrations and not transmitting them through the frame and into the rider. This is likely where that 5.5% reduction in vibration comes from with the goosen wheels. For all other frequencies though, the PSDs look virtually identical. And so zooming out a little bit, what does all this actually mean? Well, for me on smooth to average paved roads, I honestly never felt a difference between the two wheels in terms of comfort and vibration damping. Even on dirt where the road input was severe and the ride was much more jarring, I couldn't feel a significant difference between the two wheel sets. Now I do think that perhaps for higher intensity road input, like on dirt trails or even mountain bikes, the polymer spokes may have a more pronounced advantage in terms of vibration damping, but on smooth roads, not so much. Now I know that's perhaps not what you wanted to hear. After all, the Goosen wheels are significantly more expensive at just around $2,000 or $2,100 US on Pandapodium's website. But again, I'm just reporting my experience and how it tends to agree with the data that I measured. Now there aren't a ton of videos on the Goosen wheels out right now. I imagine more will start being posted over the next few months. But of the videos that are posted, the results are also kind of mixed. One person claimed that the goose and wheels are super comfortable and they could notice the vibration damping and compliance immediately. While another YouTuber who also happened to collect some data and who also put these wheels through the ringer agreed that from a ride feel perspective, they weren't noticeably more compliant or comfortable than any other wheel set that they had tried. Now, Joe from Pandapodium tends to sit on the other side of the spectrum. He and his team put together a really great blog post about their testing with the wheels. It includes some theoretical background along with some real world testing and definitely represents a solid effort. Now, they did some vibrational analysis with the smartphone accelerometer and used the power loss formula to calculate losses for three different wheel sets at four different tire pressures. Now, as Joe even mentions, the math assumes that the entire bike plus the cyclist mass is accelerating and vibrating with the same intensity. So the power loss figures are hugely overstated, but that the trends are what we should pay attention to. Now, when it came to real world testing, what Joe found was that at lower speeds, the polymer spoke wheels did give a slight advantage in terms of speed through a set course at a fixed power. However, at higher speeds and higher power, the results were a little bit more varied with the steel spoked Roval wheels being the fastest. And I think this kind of captures just how challenging it can be to put together a meaningful study. While the math and the theory suggest one thing, very often real world findings will demonstrate something else. In the case of this blog post, changing wind patterns, imperfect power output, and a host of other variables will all affect the outcome in one way or another. I suppose looking at Joe's conclusions, my data mostly agrees, although I'm gonna put an asterisk by number one. I know the biggest selling point of the wheels is the vibration damping properties of the high-tech polymer spokes, but I just wanna be careful not to overstate the amount of damping and compliance provided by the spokes themselves. Again, in my experience, I couldn't really feel a significant difference between the carbon spoked wheel and the polymer spoked wheel, and my data generally supports that. Looking at some other information here, the published effective spring rate of the TIE-FI polymer spoke is 380 newtons per millimeter. This means that in order to stretch the spoke by one millimeter, you have to apply 380 newtons or about 38.7 
kilograms of force. And keep in mind there are 20 spokes supporting the rim, and these can roughly be considered springs in parallel, which makes the effective spring rate additive. In other words, the system of spokes produces a much stiffer spring than the individual. Just consider a scenario where you only had, say, three spokes supporting the rim in line with the load path. That means you'd have to apply 116.1 kilograms of force just to get it to deflect one millimeter. Now, the tire mounted on the rim is also a spring. And through some of the research I've done on campus with some of my students, we found that even a skinny 28 millimeter Rene Hurst extra light casing road tire requires just 10.3 kilograms of force to deflect the tire by one millimeter at 80 PSI. In other words, the tire is a spring that's an order of magnitude softer than the spokes of the wheel. So any vertical compliance felt by the rider is primarily coming from the tire and not the spokes. Now the obvious thing to point out here is that the goose and polymer spokes are not the first to offer a stringy type spoke. I'm sure by now someone who only watched the first two minutes of this video already commented down below that bird spokes have been around for years and some mountain bikers swear by them for their vibration absorption properties. Now I actually do have a set of bird spoked MTB wheels on the way for testing but as of now, I don't have any actual experience with them. What I will say is that perhaps in the MTB setting where the trail input is much higher than on road, it's possible that the combination of tire and spoke is actually measurable and more pronounced than on road bikes. This idea is somewhat supported by my data here in this video as we saw virtually no vibration reduction on smooth roads, but a 5.5% reduction on the gravel trail where it was a little bit rougher. Now I'll definitely link to that bird spoke video when I get around to making it, so definitely stay tuned for that. Okay, so at the end of the day, what do we have? We have two road wheel sets, one with carbon spokes for about $1,100 and one with high-tech polymer spokes for about double the price. Now personally, I enjoyed riding both wheel sets during the testing period, did one wheel set offer a significantly better ride experience, either in terms of speed, weight, or comfort? Not really. The goose and wheels are definitely interesting, and I think that polymer spokes have potential advantages in terms of reducing weight and increasing strength. But personally, as of right now, I'm not 100% convinced that they're what the road cyclist needs to be more comfortable on the bike. Now, I should have mentioned it earlier, but both of these wheel sets were sent to the channel for review at no charge. The Super Team wheels from Super Team and the Goosen wheels from Joe over at Panda Podium. Now, I wasn't paid by either company and neither brand has seen this video before it went live. I also want to mention that I believe Joe and his team at Panda Podium put out a legitimate and unbiased study on the effect of the different spokes. Now, yes, they do sell wheels, but they also sell wheels with carbon, polymer, and steel spokes. So I don't believe that they were trying to promote the polymer spoke wheels in any way. From all my interactions with Joe so far, he's super knowledgeable and definitely trustworthy. I just think that we've reached different conclusions based on our own experimental studies. So the point of all this, I think, is just that. Different people seem to have different experience with these polymer spoke wheels. Riding style, rider weight, bike setup, tire choice, tire pressure, these are all variables that will factor into the overall experience. And so again, I think as with most things cycling related, just be informed, be a little bit skeptical, and perhaps most importantly, just don't blindly buy into the marketing materials without doing your due diligence. All right, well, that's gonna do it for this one. If you have any questions or constructive feedback, I'd love to keep the conversation going down in the comments. It's gonna do it for this one. Thanks again for watching, and thanks for subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, and we'll see you next time.